I think the founders were, weren't uh, wary enough of democracy, actually. Hi, I'm Nick Gillespie with Reason TV, and today we're talking with David Harsanyi. He's a syndicated columnist. We run his stuff at Reason.com. He's a senior editor at The Federalist. We'll talk about that. But first, we're going to talk about his newest book, The People Have Spoken and They Are Wrong, The Case Against Democracy. David, thanks for talking to us. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, the Case Against Democracy, laid out uh, succinctly. <laughs> well, there are three levels to it. One, I have a philosophical problem with the idea that if a ton of people say something's right or moral, uh, that it is. Secondly, I have a big problem with a ton of people saying something's moral and then coercing me to d act like them and, and, and do the things they want. And thirdly, I have structural problems with democracy as a way of governing because it doesn't work very well. Okay, and, uh, well, let's uh, start with voting. Uh, okay. You know, you, uh, you slag voting a lot in this. You have a great quote from Oriana Falacci, the great Italian journalist, saying, I would rather spit in my own face than vote. Uh, you know, what's the, what's the problem with voting? This is, uh, well, isn't this what our forefathers died for, the right to vote? No, I don't think so. But uh, I mean, I think we put a lot of value into voting that we shouldn't because there are more important things than voting. When we talk about freedom, we're always talking about the vote, not about a constitution that protects our individual freedoms, our right uh -huh. to say what we want, to not be spied on, to assemble, things like that. We're always concentrating on a vote as if that means freedom, which it doesn't. Democracy is just a process. It reflects the morals and ethics of the people who vote. It doesn't guarantee you freedom. Just check out the Gaza Strip or Egypt or anywhere else. So, uh, well, here's a question because so your, I mean, your basic argument is that democracy, you know, is a process. But you, what you're talking about, uh, what's great about America is the Constitution, which limits the power of government, uh, which limits the size and scope of government. Um, and so we shouldn't praise democracy because that's really just mob rule. Yeah, we should also praise that democracy is diffused in so many different ways that we can live in our own communities the way we want. I lived in Colorado for many years. You know, there's Boulder, very liberal, and there's uh, Colorado Springs, very conservative. I could live in either one without the other, t you know, telling us what to do just because they have a bigger population. One so, well, here's the question, because what I was going to say is, that, you know, but the, the Constitution ultimately, uh, you know, was voted on by people and, uh, you know, a majority of people are put together majority. behind closed doors. Right? All of this. <laughs> and, you know, so why, um, you know, at what, how do you know that mob rule or majority rule is not a problem and you know what's wrong with Boulder being very liberal and Colorado Springs being very conservative there's nothing the problem happens when you have Boulder trying to tell Colorado Springs how to live their lives or vice versa mm -hmm. I think the founders were, weren't uh, wary enough of democracy, actually. I, I think uh, there are bigger problems with it. Listen, the biggest fascists I've ever met as a reporter were on school boards, right, or mm -hmm. condo boards. So I don't like the process anyway, but when you have a centralized government in Washington that can coerce people to buy health care that, you know, that they decide, uh, I can't move to another town or another mm -hmm. state and live my life the way I want to. And this goes with society's norms as well. For instance, marriage. I, I think government should get out of marriage, not keep redefining it as to, you know, to, mm -hmm. to whatever the whims of society are. Uh, but then at what level of governance would people be allowed to say, okay, well, you know what, um, we are going to allow spying uh, in this community or we are going to define marriage as between one man and one duck. Uh, you know, in uh, Rick Santorum's the duck uh, consent, fever dream. I'm, I'm, I'm for it. Uh, but no, but you know, is, is there a place in your scheme then to say, that's okay, why well, you have there a are towns? Well, that's why you have yeah. a constitution to stop that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, in the end, we, we have to have some kind of democratic process to elect people to run things. Mm -hmm. But uh, we don't have to give them ultimate power over the, just, you know, over the constitution. Yeah. And, over and the even at the more local level, like, do we, are we supposed to cede more power to the smaller, to a kind of smaller level of government because we can move from there? And also because the, the closer democracy is to you, the more, uh, you know, the more it reflects the constituents there. You know, mm -hmm. America's a huge place with a lot of different ideas. The, the closer we have government, that doesn't make it always all right, but it right. makes it, I think it gives us a, a little bit of a more guarantee that you're going to reflect the community in a better way. Right. Okay, so uh, in the book, you also then you come out in favor of gridlock. Uh, you know, this is one of the bet noirs of good government types everywhere, both conservatives and uh, liberals are complaining about gridlock. We can't get anything done. What's the case for gridlock? Well, first of all, that's the voters' fault who believe that 96% yeah. of voters think Congress is doing a terrible job. I think inadvertently, because there are a bunch of idiots there, but they are doing a great job in stopping government cold. And you know, mm -hmm. you have a, you have a liberal governor, a liberal uh, president. And you have a, a huge uh, policy change in Obamacare. 
And then you have a reaction to that. It's organic, I think, and then it stops everything. So I'm very happy that we have gridlock. I think it's wonderful. I mean, I think what happens though country. with uh, you know cases like the debt limit or uh, you know funding for the next year? Uh, is it you know is it a good thing just to have government be so incompetent that it can't even write its own checks? Yeah, you know, sometimes I wonder that you know they'll sink the economy. That's because government's too big to start with. But they always pretty much get it done. I think yeah. that we 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 have sort of widespread panic in the media that's not there in real life with real people. We get the debt limit will be, will be will raise and we'll get it done. I mean, I, I think that you can see that every, in the end there is some sort of compromise. Compromise comes together because you have a disagreement and at some point you have to get it done and they do. And it is kind of fascinating that, uh, you know, nobody ever says that Obama should compromise on his nominees. It's that they should be appointed without any question. Well, and but then it, it rarely, that, that courtesy rarely gets extended. That's because the of the incompetence direction. of Republicans to make make a compelling argument about their case, which sometimes they don't have a very good one, frankly. But I think you'll see now, if, if the Republicans win the Senate, as everyone, you know, a lot of people think they will, you'll see Obama vetoing bills, and then you right. won't hear about gridlock anymore. You'll hear about someone saving the uh, Republic. Yeah. From, from Do you, are you hopeful that, you know, 2016 or further down the line, that will actually build a consensus for a smaller government? And, and government will do whatever it takes to actually resize the, uh, you know, cut the size of government. Not really, because I think people feel libertarian about the world, but they don't vote libertarian that often. I, I, I'm, I'm somewhat hopeful because I think younger people are, I think you may, you may have written about this, younger people are skeptical about big institutions, and I'm talking about government, but yeah. also crony capitalism, things like that. I think that's a wonderful, wonderful, uh, wonderful development, but uh, the vo they're still very liberal and they believe in sort of authoritarian power, I think, a little bit too much. So we'll see. I mean, yeah, you know, yeah, no, and it's a uh, uh, new uh, poll on millennials came yeah. out saying that they are deeply distrustful of government and other large institutions, but more than any other sector of the population, they believe that government should be bigger right. and provide more service. And I so. wonder, I think they're just probably like everyone else. I think they'll yeah. be just like their parents in the end, frankly. You know. That's, uh, yeah, <laughs> as, doesn't the, as happen. the father of a millennial, That's I don't know right. who, if he or me would be more depressed by that. <laughs> uh, well, let's talk about one of the things you're doing uh, beyond the book uh, is also working with The Federalist. This is a uh, relatively new website publication. You're a senior editor there. Tell us about The Federalist. Well, we, uh, we started, I guess, six months ago with uh, the founders, Ben Dominich and uh, Molly Hemingway's there, and mm -hmm. Sean Davis. And we are trying to appeal, I think, to people who, uh, who don't want the quick hits like you see a lot now mm -hmm. on websites, but like a little bit of a, of a deep dive on cultural things and not simply just always politics 24-7, not a site that's always bashing liberals 24-7. But a more thoughtful approach, and that's not to say we don't need that. You know, I, right. I think it's, it's, it's I'm not uh, I'm not horrified by the thought of people attacking each other in partisan ways. But uh, we, we try to be more maybe like a magazine might be in the old in the older style. What? Why is it called the Federalist? We love federalism. We like mm -hmm. we we are, are federalists there. But uh, I think that we lean towards the sort of new libertarian populism that mm -hmm. uh, was much discussed a few months ago. Yeah. Why um, do you think libertarian populism? Uh, why did that? grab uh, many people in the uh, kind of the public imagination. What, what does libertarian populism offer that say regular conservatism doesn't or you know non-adjectival libertarianism? I think it's really maybe repurposed fusionism you know mm -hmm. I think it, it's, it's a way to bring together a lot of d different groups under the, on the right uh, under you know sort of the Tea Party types, but also libertarians maybe uh, under under one umbrella. I think it appeals to people because most people think they're libertarians on some level, and mm -hmm. uh, we can offer them a little here and there. But I mean, uh, populism is something as you can tell from my book. I'm not crazy about the word, and I, I think that I wish there was a better moniker for it. Yeah. Well, we will leave it there. The uh, site is the Federalist, and the book by David Harsanyi is the People Have Spoken and They Are Wrong. The Case Against Democracy. David, thanks for talking to us. Thank you. For Reason TV, I'm Nick Gillespie.